What's up, Eco Nerdlings? In this podcast, we're going to be talking about soil nutrients and sustainability. So we have two different classifications of soil nutrients. We have macronutrients, macro means large, and micronutrients, micro means itty bitty. So macronutrients are larger in atomic structure and include nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Micronutrients that are classified in that uh, way for soil include selenium, zinc, as well as iron. So we also have different types of fertilizers and labels. We have organic fertilizers and inorganic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers include fertilizers that are composed of animal manure, crop residues, bone meal, as well as compost. Inorganic fertilizers are man-made from different chemical compounds that they've basically combined together. So the benefits of inorganic fertilizers include that they can control the exact compositions um, they know exactly what's going into them. So they can basically mix these fertilizers exactly the way, the way they want them for specific crops. They're soluble and thus they're immediately available to the plant. However, there's always costs or downfalls to these. Uh, some of the costs are that they quickly leach away and this continues to pollute waters to this day. And it doesn't help the water holding capacity of the soil like organic fertilizers do. So in recent years, you might have heard a lot about hydroponics. So what is it? You may have gone to a store and bought a tomato or some other type of fruit or vegetable and looked at it and it says hydroponically grown in Texas or hydroponically grown in Montana. What is hydroponically grown and what does it mean? Well, hydroponics are growing plants in fertilized water. It's a method of suspending plants in water and solutions that are involved with it. So one of the crops that they is that are grown hydroponically are cranberries. So what are the costs of hydroponics? Well, as you can imagine, it's very labor intensive and expensive because it has to be constantly monitored. So because it has to be constantly monitored, it gets very expensive because you have to pay more workers to be there constantly monitoring the different types of levels of compounds in those waters to make sure they're exact and they're going to produce uh, the type of growth and plant that they want. So what are the benefits? Well, you can control the environment and grow plants where there is no soil. So NASA is actually looking into this for growing uh, crops whenever they send astronauts into space so they have fresh food. So the Green Revolution and its environmental impact. Since 1950, there's been a very high input in agriculture and it's produced more crops per unit of land. In 1967, we had fast-growing dwarf varieties of rice and wheat that were developed for the tropics as well as the subtropics. So lack of water, high costs for small farmers, and physical limits to increasing crop yields hinder expansion of the Green Revolution. So since 1978, the amount of irrigated land per person has declined due to the depletion of underground water supplies, inefficient irrigation methods, salt buildup, as well as the cost of irrigating those plants. So we have modern agriculture that has a greater harmful environmental impact than any other human activity. We have a loss of the variety of genetically different crops and livestock strains that might limit raw material needed for future green and gene revolutions. In the United States, 97% of the food plant varieties that were available in 1940 no longer exist in large quantities. So food production, so looking at the natural capital degradation, so some of the costs that are occurring right now. We have a loss in biodiversity, uh, loss in degradation of grasslands, forests, wetlands, uh, fish kills because of all the pesticide runoffs that are occurring and getting swept into the water, uh, killing wild predators to protect livestock. So we've taken out some of those top apex predators. One of the most common examples that you guys have heard of are all of the wolves that got killed off. Almost the entire population of wolves was uh, taken out. And when we killed off all the wolves, we killed off all of the natural predators to a lot of the grazers, such as deer, elk, antelope. And when we took those natural predators out, all of those animals were allowed to continue grazing and a lot of them overgrazed. So taking out those apex predators can cause a lot of damage to the environments that we didn't think about when we were doing that. Currently, we're removing the apex predator from the ocean. 
We are killing hundreds of millions of sharks every single year to make shark fin soup. We also have a loss of genetic diversity of wild crop strains, and we've replaced them with monoculture strains. As far as soil goes, we have lots of soil erosion, loss of fertility, salinization, waterlogging, desertification, uh, water, we're basically wasting a lot of water, we're depleting our aquifers, we have a lot of runoff that's occurring, uh, water is getting extremely polluted because of all of the chemical pesticide runoff, uh, fertilizers, all of that. Uh, air pollution, we're emitting a lot of greenhouse gases, we're polluting it from our fossil fuels, uh, chemical plants. All of these things are contributing to air pollution. And not only are we damaging our environment, but we're actually damaging our own health. We have nitrates in our drinking water now because of all of the fertilizers that we use. We have pesticide residues in the drinking water and air. Uh, we've contaminated our drinking and swimming water with uh, diseased organisms uh, and livestock wastes. And we have a lot of bacterial contamination of our meat because we're packing our animals that we eat in our livestock into these areas that basically just breed disease because they don't even have room to move. So all of these things are contributing to the decline in human health. So the gene revolution. To increase crop yields, we can actually mix the genes of similar types of organisms, and we can also mix the genes of very different organisms. Artificial selection has been used for centuries to develop genetically improved varieties of crops, or selective breeding. But something we're doing now is genetic engineering, which develops improved strains at an exponential pace compared to artificial selection. So this is the controversy that's arisen uh, very recently over genetically modified food or genetically modified organisms. So mixing of genes. Uh, this is called genetic engineering, and it involves splicing a gene from one species and transplanting the DNA into another. So something that you might have heard of is called the P-GLO gene. So we've managed to take the glowing gene out of a jellyfish, splice it into a bacteria, and then somehow we make that bacteria glow because we have genetically modified it. Well, that's what we're doing with our food. So there are advantages as well as disadvantages to genetically modified crops and foods. So some of the advantages are going to be we need less fertilizer, less water. Uh, they're more resistant to insects, disease, frost, and drought because we will engineer them that way. Uh, they will grow faster. They can grow in unfavorable conditions such as very high salinity, uh, different temperature fluctuations. We can breed them to spoil at a slower rate. Uh, we can breed them to be pesticide resistant so we don't need to use as many pesticides. Uh, they could tolerate higher levels of herbicides and they'll produce higher yields. Some of the disadvantages include irreversible and unpredictable genetic and ecological effects. Basically what this means is we have no idea what's going to happen with all of this genetic splicing and mixing that we're doing. Uh, we could release harmful toxins in the food from possible plant cell mutations, uh, new allergens in food. So think about someone with a very severe peanut allergy, for example. If we took a gene from a peanut and we put it into a tomato or a watermelon. If that person who is severely allergic to that peanut ate that watermelon or that genetically altered tomato, are they going to be allergic to the tomato or the watermelon now and potentially die from it? We don't know. These are all concerns that are coming up with the GMOs. Uh, we have an increased development of pesticide resistant insects and plant diseases. It can create herbicide-resistant uh, weeds, and it can harm beneficial insects, such as our bees. And it can also lower genetic diversity. So another thing that we're constantly producing is our livestock. About half of the world's meat is produced by livestock grazing on grass in a natural way. The other half is produced under factory-like conditions called feedlots. Basically, we are just raising meat. Uh, these are densely packed livestock that are fed grain or fish meal, not something they would eat in the wild or eat in nature. So they're basically being fed a diet that they're not normally going to eat. So uh, eating more chicken and farm-raised fish as, instead of uh, beef or pork can help to reduce harmful environmental impacts of meat production. 
So what are advantages and disadvantages of animal feedlots? Well, they increase meat production. Uh, we're going to have a lot of higher profits, so it's going to be more profitable to the people producing the meat. Uh, it's going to include less land use. Uh, it's going to reduce overgrazing. It'll reduce soil erosion, and it'll help to protect biodiversity. Some of the disadvantages are that you need a large input of grain, fish meal, water, and fossil fuels. Uh, concentrate animal wastes that can pollute water. And you're going to have to use a lot of antibiotics, and that's going to increase genetic resistance to microbes in humans. So how does that occur? Well, since we basically pack all of these animals into a really, really small place, disease just spreads like wildfire. One animal has an infection, it defecates on the floor, all of the other animals are stepping in it, eating off the floor, so they all have the infection. So one of the common practices is that they just constantly feed those animals antibiotics. That's why you're starting to see more and more in stores, they actually advertise antibiotic-free meat, hormone-free meat. So you know what's safer to eat. Uh, all of these antibiotics that are being used, if we're constantly consuming all of these meats that have been treated with antibiotics, we can actually get a bioaccumulation of the antibiotics in our own bodies. And we're starting to see a lot more antibiotic resistance in humans. And this is probably one of the causes. It's still up for debate. So just how many people can the world support? It all depends on food production and the population of people, basically what they're eating. So the number of people that the world supports, like I said, depends on the per capita consumption of grain and meat and how many children those couples have as well. So research has shown that those living very low on the food chain or very high on that food chain don't live as long as those that fall somewhere in between. So looking at this, it shows the kilograms of grain needed per kilogram of body weight for each of the organisms that we eat. So beef cattle is obviously going to include the most. So we're going to be uh, wasting more energy if we eat beef cattle than if we eat lower on the food chain. If we're eating chicken or if we actually eat a vegetarian diet, it's going to decrease the amount of energy. So after spectacular increases, the world's total and per capita marine and freshwater fish and shellfish catches have actually leveled off. So looking at these graphs right here, in 1950, we had eh, about 20 million metric tons of catch of wild catch of fish, and it drastically increased up to about 2,000. So in the 1970s and 1980s, they started developing aquaculture techniques. So you see right here, that aquaculture has actually started increasing. So catching and raising more fish and shellfish. Government subsidies given to fishing industry are a major cause of overfishing of our oceans. So we have global fishing industry that spends about $25 billion per year, more than its catch is actually worth. So without subsidies, many of the fishing fleets would actually go out of business. And subsidies allow excess fishing with some keeping their jobs longer and making less money. We're raising large amounts of uh, fish and shellfish in ponds and cages is the world's fastest growing type of food production. And that's called aquaculture. Fish farming involves cultivating fish in a controlled environment and then harvesting them in captivity. Fish ranching involves holding the anadromous species that live part of their lives in freshwater and part in salt water. Uh, these fish are held for the first few years, and then they're released. They're harvested when they actually return to spawn. So what are advantages and disadvantages of aquaculture? Well, it includes a very high efficiency of production. We're going to have a very high yield in a small volume of water. It's going to help us reduce over-harvesting of conventional fisheries. Uh, it's going to include a low fuel use, high profits, and the profits are not tied to the price of oil. Some of the disadvantages include that it, we need a large input of land, feed, and water. We're going to need a large uh, waste output, and it's going to destroy a lot of our mangrove forests as well as estuaries. We're going to use a lot of grain to feed some of the species, which again, is not the natural diet of the fish. Uh, you're gonna have dense populations that are gonna be vulnerable to diseases just like those feeding lots for terrestrial animals that we eat. And then the tanks are going to be too contaminated to use after about five years.
So what are more sustainable approaches to aquaculture? Well, first of all, we can use less fish meal to actually uh, help to reduce the depletion of other fish. Uh, it's going to improve the management of aquaculture wastes. We could reduce the escape of aquaculture species into the wild. We could restrict the location of fish farms to reduce loss of mangrove forests and estuaries. Uh, we could farm some aquaculture species in deeply submerged cages. That way it will protect them from wave action predators and it will also allow their wastes to dilute out into the ocean naturally. And we also could start certifying sustainable forms of aquaculture. So moving towards global food security. One of the things that's popped up recently are urban farms or urban gardens. So people in these urban areas could actually save money by growing more of their own food. Urban gardens provide about 15% of the world's food population and up to 90% of the world's food is actually wasted. So what are some solutions towards more sustainable food production? We can increase our food security by slowing the population growth, uh, sharply reducing poverty, slowing environmental degradation of the world's soils and croplands. All of these need a lot of work and it's gonna take a lot of political involvement and a lot of people working together to create a world like this where we're not having a huge population growth, where we're actually slowing our environmental degradation, we're reducing poverty. That's not something that's gonna happen overnight, but that is something that we need to start working towards to conserve all of our resources. Well, I hope you learned a lot. This is the Queen Nerdling signing off for today. Stay nerdy till next time.